Amen. Amen. Thank you, Deacon John Grant, uh, for opening us up in prayer. I take it so seriously uh, when we uh, open up in prayer. I do not take for granted that uh, I'm just going to be able to share the word of God willy-nilly and uh, just because uh, I'm the pastor. I think that God wants uh, us to ask his blessing, his direction, his protection, um, and um, uh, we want him to guide us in this time uh, that we are together in the word. Um, we've talked about how Habakkuk is a unique book in that the entire narrative is not addressing human beings as much as it is addressing um, Yahweh himself, and people are kind of in the background listening in. So the people of Habakkuk's day were listening in kind of the way we do, reading uh, the scripture uh, all these uh, millennia later. And, um, uh, and so a quick review of what we've been talking about. I won't do it as exhaustively as we've done before now, but um, I want to talk about major themes. The major themes to remind you are world crisis, cultural decline, uh, regardless of what the nation is or what section of the world it's in. There's a lot of cultural decline going on, particularly in Israel. There is the problem of injustice, that it seems that God is using worse people to judge bad people. And then the cosmic questions of God's existence, of God's involvement. Uh, I think it's very interesting that, um, I don't know if I shared this, but most of the the um, fathers of this nation, uh, most of uh, the founding fathers of the United States of America were what we call deists, deists. So they had a view of a transcendent God, but they did not have much of a developed view of an immanent God. So transcendent means that God is all powerful and is over his creation. Immanent, I M M. Uh, A-N-E-N-T, imminent means that God is involved with his creation, and that comes from a name of God, Emmanuel, from the Old Testament, specifically um, um, Isaiah 7, 14. So he's Emmanuel, uh, he's God with us, as well as God that is transcendent, and that's a kind of cosmic question. That if there is a God, how can he behold so much evil, wickedness, injustice, uh, meaningless violence? Uh, there were five people shot on the uh, campus of uh, Morgan State University last night, and um, which is just, you know, they're celebrating homecoming, and all of a sudden there's all this shooting going on. I don't know that there's been any progress in that story developing. Uh, we've heard we hear more and more about shootings, and uh, no one has the will, political or otherwise, uh, to revisit the gun issue because we are such a libertarian nation, and people want to have the freedom to have any gun, bear any arms they want. I think it's a misunderstanding uh, of the Second Amendment. This idea of bearing arms, the right to bear arms, uh, really has to do with a um, a government that is, it was, it was uh, by the uh, founding fathers, that if there were tyrants um, that were at the seat of government, that we would be able to bear arms. You cannot disarm the citizenry so you can tell them what to do and control their lives. That's a very rare, it's almost impossible that it would happen that um, a president uh, or a Congress or any kind of legislative body would be able to disarm the um, uh, population. And I see sometimes uh, uh, bumper stickers and people, you know, go ahead and try to take it. I was reading a bumper sticker yesterday. Come on, come and take it or something like that. I mean, it's just so silly. Oh man, it's just so many people that don't think very deeply in our time. We're at a time of heightened emotion where there's not a lot of thought, much less nuanced thought as to what is going on. Uh, and so there are some things, it's just a good idea to have background checks uh, before you have a gun where you can kill people, particularly a semi-automatic weapon or automatic weapon. It's just so simple. It's so logical. It makes sense so much so that there are people, you know, uh, I think it's Dick Sporting Goods that really, really wants to make money. Dick Sporting Goods loves money. But even though they love money, they've stopped selling guns. 
I think that's great. I think that's great uh, that they gave up. It's a kind of conscience um, uh, led capitalism, which I'll talk about in a moment. So we have cosmic questions about God. Is he involved? Does he care? Maybe you have had questions about God, of whether he cared about you when you were going through a personal crisis. And then, of course, the greatest of those questions, we have revisited these three weeks, is God good in difficult times? Is God good in difficult times? I say a resounding yes, a resounding yes, that is my bias. And I've given you this purpose statement, Habakkuk's purpose uh, before we move on with this week's material, Habakkuk offers us a snapshot of how difficult times unfold. The proud are humbled, the faithful live by faith in God, and while God may seem silent and uninvolved in our world, he always has a plan to deal with evil, and he always works out justice eventually. He always works out justice eventually. This is a good time to look at uh, our homework. I gave you some homework last week. Uh, three study questions, reflection questions. And uh, the first uh, reflection question that I gave you to think about is, why do you think God told Habakkuk to write down the vision or revelation? Uh, that is, uh, what is the practical value of that command? Why would God ask uh, or command, actually, Habakkuk to write down the vision or revelation, they're kind of synonyms. And what is the practical value of God's command to Habakkuk? You can write that uh, in chat, your answer, or you can raise your hand and uh, I'll try to call on you if you raise your hand. So um, why did God ask that of him to write down the vision? Why do you think God did that? And then what is the practical value of that kind of a command to write down the vision. Okay, Tiara, yes. I think we have unmuted you. Hello? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think it's because um, the short answer is that he needed direction and something to do. Like after mm. we discussed the first few chapters of how he kept asking God what he was going to do, and he wasn't really trying to be part of the plan. And plus, he already felt helpless, I think, because he was already a messenger giving all the messages. So he kind of reached the end of like his feeling like he was useful, or and I feel like he felt lost because of the time but mm -hmm. i think writing the vision helped give him a renewed sense of hope and purpose because the those times weren't going to last and you know the people would need a plan to direct themselves out of that current era so i think mm -hmm. it helped him to have a renewed sense of hope and direction and for the people he was writing it for good i like particularly your idea of God giving Habakkuk something to do. That's great. That God gave Habakkuk something to do. Um, there's another one. Uh, the John Gillises say uh, thoughts can be fleeting, but writing it down creates a reference of how faithful God is. That's good. That if I write it down, uh, I may not be able to remember all my thoughts, but I will probably permanent re permanently remember what I write down, particularly, and I don't know if Habakkuk knew this right away, I got a sense he did, that what he wrote down would be scripture, would be a part of the canon of scripture. By the way, uh, since this is Bible class, I'll tell you, whenever you hear me say canon of scripture, the reason why I say canon, C-A-N-O-N, -N, canon means measure. Uh, it is the measure. It is the um, standard for divine revelation, the canon of scripture, because everything did not make it into the canon of scripture. There are other faith traditions under the um, um, heading of Christendom that has the Apocrypha, and the Apocrypha, or literally false writings, um, or hidden writings is probably a better way. That's what it is, hidden writings. There is Pseudepigrapha, which is another thing altogether. Pseudepigraphist false writings. 
which no one embraces as sacred literature. But then there's the Apocrypha, the hidden writings, that um, has not met the stringent tradition of hermeneutics, the science of interpreting the Bible. They just don't seem to uh, reach, you know, Judith and Tobit and First and Second Maccabees and uh, there are these different estrus, first and second estrus. I'm a, I'm familiar with these books, but uh, I don't preach from these books because they don't meet the canonical uh, standard of what the 66 books of the canon meet. So sometimes I say words and uh, people may not know what I'm referring to. So yeah, he probably knew, Habakkuk, that what he wrote would be in the canon of scripture. Sister Lenny says permanence and legacy for the future appointed time. Yeah, there's a kind of permanence to writing things down that is not so with the verbal, uh, the ex exclamations and the um, the cries, the primal cries that he's given before God. I don't even know that I've done justice to the primal nature of what um, Habakkuk was saying to Yahweh, Jehovah. Uh, Deacon Russ says he wanted an accurate account of what was about to happen for future generations. Yes, writing the scriptures down, uh, he wanted him to write down. By the way, uh, we use this term sometimes amanuensis, and amanuensis uh, is someone who uh, takes down dictation, uh, and amanuensis are those persons uh, that took down dictation, for instance, for the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul never wrote anything except his signature, uh, maybe for a few of the uh, books of the Bible that he wrote, but he dictated uh, all of the books of Scripture. Uh, the letters, the uh, epistles that he wrote were all dictated. In a sense, God is dictating to Habakkuk. He is dictating to him what his plan is for the future concerning all of the things that Habakkuk complained about. So there's a kind of kindness of God, an attentiveness of God. And yes, that would be accurate for future generations when that crisis had been averted because he knew it would be misplaced from people saying things that were not true uh, or forgotten. Yes, that it kind of creates a standard narrative for what is going to happen. Good, good. The other thing, yes, the revelation was not just for the prophet. Rarely is. The revelation was for the people of God and the people of God that were not yet born and people like you and I that would later read the scripture. It's like having a prayer journal so as to not forget what was told. Yes, there was great comfort to Habakkuk. Uh, and Sister Kiara says, I think this was for Habakkuk to have sight on what the vision was. When it is written, you can see exactly what God is calling you to do. Also, it shows all who are called to be a part of the vision to see it plainly as well. Good answers. Good, thoughtful answers to that first question. So let's do another one. The second one, second one, what does it mean to live by faith? This is a kind of subjective one. I didn't even have anything in mind. I just want to hear what you think. What does it mean to live by faith? One of the, maybe the central verse of the whole text, the whole text of Habakkuk is the just or the righteous shall live by faith. Uh, what does that mean to live by faith? What are your ideas about that? What is your ideas about that? Okay. You can raise your hand and I'll call on you if you want to talk to me or you can put it in chat. Okay. Uh, Deacon Alice says, to go not knowing nor seeing yet, uh, believing. Okay, good, good, good. All right. Uh, what does it mean to live by faith? Okay, Michelle, what does it mean to live by faith? Um, I would say it's like unconditional, like trusting God. Like you have to really like trust God to live by faith. And you also have like, you also have to have like a relationship with God as well. Good, good, good. You have to have a relationship if you're going to live by faith. That's for sure. That is for sure. Good, good. Uh, uh, Sister Lini says having a quiet confidence that God is good no matter what. Mm, yeah, I agree. A quiet confidence. That means I can't always work out what I want 
uh, to happen in my tongue. My mouth may not get me out of certain things. To believe what you can't see, yes. Uh, to not just go by what you see, that's good too. Not knowing what will happen, but having trust in God for what does happen. Indeed, yes, I don't know what's going to happen, but I trust God for what's going to happen. To live outside of what you can do in your own strength. To live outside what you can do. Yeah, I need some clarification on that one. That's a little cryptic. Make it, make it clear. Christiana, can you clear, clarify what you mean by to live outside of what you can do in your own strength? Um, what I was trying to say was um, that to live outside of what you can do in your own strength is that if I can do it, then it's like God didn't do it. If I can, I have to live in, in a manner that's beyond my own thoughts and what I can do because a lot of times my what I think is narrow yes God has a much broader plan for me yeah so living by faith is living according to how he sees your life and not what I can do with my life good but doesn't the Bible say uh God helps those who help themselves isn't that in the Bible I don't think that's biblical you don't think that's in the Bible I don't, I mean, I don't know that scripture. And, Somebody and told me that know. was in the Bible, that uh, God helps those who help themselves. Come right after cleanliness is next to godliness. That's not in no, the scripture. That is, <laughs> huh? No, that's not in the Bible. That, yeah, it's but not. But it does say trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. Good. But, uh, that's good. And he will make that's your way straight. Well, see, that's all you had to say in the first place if you want to <laughs> quote. Proverbs 3, absolutely excellent, excellent. That's an excellent text for to live outside of what you can do in your own strength. Velma says, complete trust and confidence in God. Good. To follow God's guidance without being influenced by the world. Ooh, that's not so easy all the time. Not being influenced by the world, but following God's guidance. Not grasping on to your plan as opposed to God's plan. Yeah, that's good. Uh, trust his hand when you can't see his heart. That's good. Excellent. And uh, yeah, I like it. Or trace his hand. That's good. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yes, um, God helps those uh, who help themselves is nowhere to be found in the Bible. You are very right, Chris Brooms. You're very right. I just was testing to see if Christiana knew that ain't in the Bible. <laughs> okay, good. Yes, yes. Um, that's kind of holding on to your prerogatives. I think people say that, have said that over the years to hold on to their prerogatives that the, I don't want to just sit here and do nothing. Here's a third and final thought question. What description does God give of mankind on earth that you observe uh, on earth today? What do you see today that God said then in chapter two of Habakkuk? You can raise your hand and talk to me, or you can put it in chat. What uh, description does God give of mankind that you observe on earth today? Anyone want to jump in on that one? There is a sense in which uh, um, there's nothing new under the sun. That's one of the, under the sun is the theme of Ecclesiastes. Uh, by the way, Ecclesiastes is one of those books that almost didn't make it into the canon of Scripture. Almost didn't make it into the canon of Scripture because of uh, its subject matter being so secular. And this talk of under the sun, this idea of under the sun. Okay, yeah, so greedy, greediness, greed is most definitely, definitely something we see in the world today. We see in the world, well, there's a greed trial going on in New York right now. New York City has a greed trial going on about a man who inflated exponentially the value of his properties uh, so that he could get a better deal with banks and make more money. And um, and that's fraud. You can't not do that. You can't uh, inflate the value of your properties to get favorable conditions uh, with a bank. You cannot do that. Yeah, yeah. Cruel and merciless people. The filming of a woman being raped on the L and no one stepping in to help her. Oh my gosh, that's a terrible story. I don't think I heard that one. 
Um, I think I missed that one, but uh, terrible, terrible story. You know, there was uh, there have been whole uh, wings of sociology. Um, I think it's called um, diffusion. Diffusion. That is that uh, there was a woman who was being sexually assaulted in New York in a housing uh, plaza where people could look out their window and see that she was being assaulted. And people watched and saw, several people saw, but no one called the police. No one called the police because everyone thought somebody else would call the police. And uh, the idea that I got to take care of myself, I can't take care of anybody else. So, yeah. Uh, dishonest gain. Yeah. Dishonest gain concerning money. And yes, idol, idolatry. Yeah. Undesirable and corrupt ways. Yeah. Okay. Kensington zombies. That's out on a limb a little bit, but I'll go for that. I'll go for that. I think there's some things in that text that looks forward to so-called Kensington zombies, which has become, by the way, speaking of what was uh, said about a woman being assaulted and no one stepping in, uh Kensington is now a tourist uh location. People come from around the world to see drug addicts in Kensington. I remember Kensington was nothing like that. It was predominantly white. You could not be around there past a certain hour. And um uh very little uh uh color in Kensington. It was mostly a white population, white poor and white working class. And that was it. And you did not hang out there too long. Yes. Uh, senseless violence. Yeah. Yeah. That is most definitely something that uh, we see. Anybody else? Did I get everybody's answer for that third one? Okay. I think I got everybody. Nobody... Uh, Okay, it's talking to me directly. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. Good answers to those questions. A simple outline we told you about. Um, this idea of the just shall live by faith. When we talk about the just, the best way to understand righteousness is that righteousness is the collective of character qualities that resemble God. The collective of character qualities that resemble God. So it's not just one thing that I'm right in what I, how I think or, or how I live. Not, not only that, but righteousness is the proper balance uh, um, throughout the Bible. Righteousness uh, has just to be just about it, that I'm uh, just in my ways. I care about my fellow man. So the best way to understand righteousness as a biblical idea is the right uh, um, a combination of character traits that resemble God in a human being, that we look more and more like God. Not just one thing, but a mix of things, sort of like a good cake has several things in it, eggs and flour and sugar, maybe butter, if you are so inclined, and maybe vanilla extract or lemon extract. It has all of the ingredients together to make a good cake. So it is with righteousness which is what that road about faith is there in that image. And so we said in the first week, faith must be tested, must be tested. The question of God's indifference was refuted by God himself. The question of God's inconsistency was revised by God, that I'm not inconsistent, even though it may seem that I am. And uh, faith must be taught. Faith must be taught. The question of God's inactivity redressed. Uh, and re-examined is really what redressed means. And uh, next week, we'll talk about faith must be triumphant. Uh, and we'll talk about the question of God's inability resolved. That is he unable uh, to deal with the issues that we face uh, in the world. Um, uh, and then we looked at the idea of the prophet's second complaint. Last week, we talked about that, that the prophet had a second complaint. Um, and it was the question of God's inconsistency. How can you use worse people to judge bad people? That didn't make any sense to Habakkuk. Maybe it doesn't, doesn't make sense to you that God would use worse people on his payroll, so to speak, to judge bad people um, that matter to God in particular because he called them to be his people. That was the second complaint, and I showed you a bunch of complaints within that complaint, the rationale behind this idea 
of questioning God's consistency uh, in using worse people to judge bad people after God said, I am raising up and I've raised up the Babylonians. And he's kind of watching and waiting is where we left Habakkuk, that uh, he's standing on the ramparts waiting for what answer I am to give to this complaint that I have. I'm going to have to give an answer, not only to myself or my own peace, but I need to give an answer to the people that are around me that are just as confused and maybe even more dramatically bereft of everything that they see and are experiencing uh, in their culture of that day. And uh, we, so God's answer is where we're going to begin this week. God's answer uh, to the idea of his uh, inconsistency is the vision awaits its appointed time. Wait for it. The vision awaits its appointed time. Wait for it. The vision, the revelation, which is eternal. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. The vision, the revelation of God, the including us in on the plan of that he has for humankind, that vision awaits for its appointed time. And it's incumbent upon us to wait for it. Here's another kind of overview of Habakkuk um, to put things in perspective. So far, we've talked about Habakkuk 1, 1 through 11, apprehending or understanding difficult times. And God says, be amazed. So what do I do when I don't know what to do? Be amazed that God is up to something you can't see. And then last uh, uh, week, we talked about accepting God's plan. That is, be patient. What do I do when I don't know what to do? Be patient and wait on God, just like that last exhortation that I just gave you, that the vision awaits its appointed time. You could say that about your life and every aspect of your life, beloved, that everything in your life that befalls you, every circumstance in which you find yourself, the scripture, the Bible, has spoken to whatever your situation is. There's nothing that can happen to you, I promise that is not covered in scripture. There are some over 6,000 promises in the Bible that addresses the whole of the human experience and the vision, the revelation of God's word awaits the manifestation of it, awaits its appointed time to which God has assigned it. In Isaiah 55, it says that uh, uh, my word will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish, look at what God says about his word. His word will accomplish what he sent it to do, that God sends creative power in his word to change the world and to change the universe. It was by his word, the word uh, from God that formed the universe that we enjoy and that we look at, most of which we are not aware of. And just as God's word formed, so let there be light, and he spoke everything into existence that can be known or seen or felt. So it is with your life that the word of God awaits its appointed time. And you got to wait for it. So be patient. And then this week, we're going to talk about adopting God's perspective. You got to adopt God's perspective. And that means be biblical. Be biblical. Not only be amazed at what God is doing, which speaks of worship, that I worship you even when I don't understand, but accept God's plan even when you don't understand it, and be patient for the manifestation of what God is going to do. Over and over in my life, God has shown up when I didn't expect him to show up, in ways I didn't expect him to show up, uh, and he's covered me. He's raised up people and places and things to conspire to work on my behalf because God is always watching his word to be made manifest in your life. Let me say that again. God is watching his word to be made manifest in your life, to, be, to become clear and seen in your life. So he's spoken the word of God over your life. One passage of scripture in the Minor Prophet says that God sings songs over you. You are so beloved of him. And it's the least we can do to be patient. But uh, this week, we're going to hear from God. God going to do all the talking this week in Bible class. God going to do all of the talking in the narrative of scripture from Habakkuk 2.2 2 to Habakkuk 2.20. I'm not going to look at every verse. I'm going to extract statements, and you'll see where I'm going with that. 
um, uh, as we talk about this idea of being biblical. Now, this is how we're going to look. We're going to we're going to choose this as a prism for our study tonight. A prism for our remaining time is this: that God in chapter two of Habakkuk reveals three dysfunctions of powerful nations. There are three major dysfunctions of powerful nations that has always been so in the world. The first of the, the world empires was Egypt. And the second of the world empires is Assyria. And the third of world empires was um, uh, uh, Babylon, which is what we're talking about right now for Habakkuk. And the fourth of world empires was, I can almost, I can kind of name them all. The fourth of the world empires uh, was Persia. The fifth of the world empires was Greece, which has brought much of our culture, things like the Senate and Congress, things like a mail system. Persia, by the way, gave us the alphabet, okay? That's the fifth. The sixth world empire was the Roman Empire. It was Greco-Roman in terms of culture, but the Roman Empire, which was the most powerful of all of the empires, but the Bible, oh, this is so deep. In Daniel, God describes in the vision that he gives Daniel that um, uh, there's iron that is a part of the Roman Empire. Lord have mercy. But also pottery. I want you to think about that for a minute. The most powerful and awesome world power we ever saw had iron to it in Daniel. Iron is the hardest metal. Iron is the best metal to fight with in antiquity. It had iron. We have a superhero called Iron Man. But fused to the iron was pottery and clay. Lord have mercy. That's where we get this idea that I have clay feet. That comes, that is a reference, an allusion uh, to the vision that Daniel had of all of the world empires. There'll only be seven in history. There won't be nine. There won't be ten. There won't be 11 or 15. There will only be seven throughout the whole of human history. There will only be seven world empires in the prophetic literature of the Old Testament and Revelation. Uh, you could make an argument that a world power is the United States of America. But the Bible doesn't seem to speak about the United States of America directly. I'll get back to that in a moment. But the Bible seems to indicate a revived Roman Empire that is talked about in Revelation. So I named all seven world powers in the history of mankind, nations that beat up on all the other nations, nations that dominated uh, uh, militaristically, they dominated culture, they dominated norms and laws, they set their own rules, all of them passed off the scene, all of them are in ruins, even as of my talking right now, all of the six world powers are no more, unless you want to say the United States is a world power, which I don't think is a prophetic world power. I do not see America, the United States, as a prophetic world power. However, when we look at God laying out for us the three dysfunctions of powerful nations, uh, all of these dysfunctions bear a shocking resemblance to the United States of America. All of the dysfunctions God names in chapter two bear a shocking resemblance to the United States of America, even though I'm making the qualification, the proviso, that the United States of America, from a biblical worldview, from an all-time historic view, prophetic lens, does not meet the standard of even Babylon. So God sees Babylon is greater than the United States of America. And he sees Greece as greater than the United States of America. He sees Rome as greater and Egypt greater than the United States of America. So we're not in that class according to God. You got to take it up with God. I don't know why, but God, uh, maybe the, 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 the length of it. It's been, you know, I don't know how long. We've only been really a superpower since what, the 50s? Uh, it's only been maybe 70 years that we have been dominant. Haven't been a long time. I'm going to say post World War II, post World War II, and we don't win World War II without Russia. Russia uh, had the most casualties in World War II. Russia saved the world. Isn't that funny? Russia saved 
the world from Hitler. If it wasn't from Russia, <laughs> um, this may have been a German nation, a German colony, uh, if it weren't for Russia. Very interesting history. So you got to read history uh, for yourself, not just take what people say about history. So let's look at these three uh, dysfunctions, three dysfunctions that I want you to look at, three dysfunctions. Materialism. Materialism is, in essence, I want stuff. I, I really like this. I chose um, I chose um, editorial cartoon uh, cartoonists to illustrate all of these three dysfunctions. Materialism, you can see happiness on a sticky this way, which would be a real big message for a mouse, right? And then you see the hundred dollars there. He got a suit, his tie. <laughs> You know, and he's dead. He's caught in the trap of materialism. It's very brilliant. You know, he got his uh, studies and flow charts. He got a briefcase. He got his lunch, his uh, block of cheese. Uh, I mean, this is a brilliant depiction of somebody who has a career and a work life and they try to get ahead and they like stuff. And this is how they end up. This is a kind of personification of a rodent that meets his end, trying to pursue uh, materialism. I want stuff. That's what that means, okay? I want stuff. Let me give you a definition, a more uh, fuller definition. Materialism is the belief that material possessions and physical comfort are the greatest good, highest value, and the ultimate reality. Nothing exists except matter, its movements, and its modifications. Therefore, people, morality, and ethics are merely transactional means to achieve desired ends. It's sort of like what Gordon Gecko said in Wall Street, the movie, greed is good. Greed is good. So, uh, the, the, so, so materialism may not mean that I'm cheating everybody. It may not mean that I'm a criminal. It may not mean that I'm taking advantage of anybody. It's kind of amoral. It's not moral or immoral. Materialism is amorality. Maybe all three of these are, are amoral, actually. Uh, and so it's the belief that material possessions, what I have, and physical comfort, maybe my health, but my comfort, my lifestyle, are the greatest good, and the highest value, and the ultimate reality. One millionaire put it this way. Uh, the best way to help the poor is to not be one of them. There's some wisdom in that, of course. Uh, the best way to help the poor is not to be one of them. There's some wisdom in that, but that's not a practicable way of living your life. Uh, that my life is not measured by things. And I cannot say that things are the highest value or the ultimate reality. It's really at its core, materialism, even though we got a lot of materialistic Christians, materialism at its core is atheistic. Because it's really saying nothing really matters or exists except matter. If I can't put my hands on it, if I can't see it, it's not real. And how is the things I see move? How do they move on Wall Street? How do they move in the stock market? What does the S&P 500 say, all right? Um, uh, uh, what are the modifications of, of stuff? Uh, and then what happens is we de-emphasize spirituality. There's no place for spirituality and materialism. And that's really bad because a lot of churches are materialistic and a lot of members of churches are materialistic. And uh, I believe the Christian Church of uh, America, the Western Church in general, the American Church, if I can talk about it as a group, um, as a uh, um, um, uh, across the board, is baptized in materialism so much so that we can't even read the Bible right. We don't even read the Bible right. We can't read the Sermon on the Mount because he's telling them, don't worry about what you're going to wear. All of the people, all of the people, all the people that heard, don't worry what you're going to wear, all of them had one outfit. They had one set of clothes. All of them, virtually, maybe with a few exceptions. Matthew had a little money from his tax collecting days. Um, maybe... What's for, what's for dinner? Bread. And if we're fortunate, we'll dip it in olive oil. Okay? And so he said that to people with nothing. 
<laughs> so we don't even read the Sermon on the Mount well because we got so much. We have so much that kind of undermines our understanding of Scripture because of the excess of what we have. And so some of us right here listening to me right now, you're secretly materialistic. You're secretly materialistic. Um, uh, you're secretly transactional. And um, there are people who are saved, go to church every Sunday, faithful, come to Bible class, but they're secretly transactional. What can I get? How can I get ahead? And so people and morality and ethics, some of us, some of us are good and live a good life. So God will bless us. That's secret materialism. I don't, I don't live a righteous life or live to please God in a manner so he'll bless me. That's not really the motivation. The motivation is relational that I please God. God gives us a, a, a sense of revelation of what he'll do for us or on our behalf. But we go into crisis sometimes when that equation doesn't work the same all the time, when I can't see my stuff coming, when I can't see God delivering, when I can't see God moving, when my physical comfort is threatened, when my material possessions are in jeopardy. There are a lot of people that wander away from the faith because their life not working out the way they think it should, because morality and ethics and people are transactional means to achieve my desired ends. It's pretty cold-blooded. Pretty cold blood. So look, look at what God says in chapter two. Says about Babylon, his desires are not upright. Wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest. There's a restlessness in material, materialistic people. In this case, a materialistic nation that is warlike. And their desires are not upright. Look at commercials. If you watch television tonight, are the desires upright in the commercials and things that are being sold? Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. How many how many cities have we built on the East Coast with the Lenny Lenape Indians or uh, the Crew Indians or the Navajo Nation? There were several nations in North America when Europeans got here. Very very few of them are left because of mass genocide. God says, God says, woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Where you show up on land that has been owned for generations and say, this is a piece of paper. This all belongs to me now. The idea of the reservations, slavery, um, uh, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, Black Wall Street that happened 100 years ago completely destroyed. Rosewood in Florida, destroyed. There are several of those stories where there have been cities that were built on bloodshed and towns that were established by injustice. This is what God says in chapter two of Habakkuk, for the one who makes it trusts his own creation. Talking about idols. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life. Or the lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. Now, this is so profound. God says that everything that we make, everything we manufacture, everything that we make in factories, whether they're here or in Singapore or in Taiwan or in China, everything that we import or export, that we put a lot of stock in, even smartphones, there is no breath in it. Now, it's not just the breath of oxygen. There is no ruach in the Hebrew. Ruach is the word used in Genesis 1, where God breathed the breath of life into mankind. And the Bible says man became a living soul. That is not only fact of what God did in creating the human race, but it also has some illustrative purposes in our lives to see that if we're going to live life well, if we're going to live the blessed life, if we're going to have fulfillment in life, if we're going to be happy, which is also a theological idea, happy is the one who loves God and who uh, meditates on his word day and night uh, in Psalm 1. If we're going to be happy, if we're going to be the God's people, we need ruach. We need God to breathe on us. We need God to make us living souls. Look at this. We can't become living souls on our own. We can't do it on our own because um, stuff is not going to make us happy. 
It's not going to fulfill us. We'll be restless. Our desires will not be upright. Our wine that we use to anesthetize our pain and to feel better. Um, um, uh, uh, the bloodshed and the way we hurt people. Um, we probably have to pay attention to how we got what we got. Was anybody abused in the clothes that I wear? Uh, we found out years ago that in Thailand, there were children in factories making Nikes. Because their little hands were perfect for sewing all of the emblems, the Nike swooshes onto the shoes. And we had to do something about that. Nike was very embarrassed about that. This worldwide company that had exploded in shoe sales uh, was using unethical labor. Happens all the time. Some of the things, the uh, diamond industry is terrible. There are people that die. They build their cities, their whole cities built just to extract diamonds or extract gold. And uh, the people are living in poverty, trying to uh, make a living, scratch out a living at a dollar a day. It's terrible. It's terrible. And there's this kind of building idolatry that some of you mentioned. And so notice this, consider this, Luke 16, 13 says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The word that was used uh, in the New Testament was mammon. Mammon was a god. It was a kind of a, a personification of the god of materialism. So Jesus saw money or mammon, which is more descriptive than money. Uh, money is an okay translation, but mammon is a better translation because mammon was a demonic force. It was a demonic spirit a demonic spirit that people bowed to because uh, the devil is the prince of the power of the air. He's the God of this world, small g. He's the God of this world. And so be careful with your desires. Be careful with believing that your material possessions is what measures your quality of life. Sometimes some of you, the best time you ever had was when you got laid off. The best time you had is when you weren't working because of sick leave or the best time in your life may have been the pandemic. <laughs> um, when you could not go anywhere that you wanted to go. Um, it may have been a really good time for you. And so I want you to uh, be careful about physical comfort, and how we view the stuff we have. Um, I try, Man, I'm up to maybe five times a year I do purging. I'm a little embarrassed to say, but I purge stuff because I my stuff uh gets too much that i need to be generous all over again and it's something that is indicative of this part of the world in which we live look at a second dysfunction a second dysfunction that god isolates in chapter two is capitalism i not only want stuff i want lots of stuff capitalism summed up is i want lots of stuff notice the uh emblem there of course, that's Coca-Cola. Enjoy Coca-Cola. Well, it says enjoy capitalism. That emblem right there that you look at on the screen is the most recognizable logo on planet Earth, more than the cross. If you showed a, 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 a book with Holy Bible on it, much of the world, billions of people would not recognize that. But everywhere you go would, would, would recognize capitalism. They would recognize the golden arches probably, but more than the golden arches, more than Subway, that is apparently the biggest uh, um, fast food chain. Subway has overtaken uh, McDonald's. More than that even is, is, is Coca-Cola, which is this kind of symbol of capitalism. I want lots of stuff. The whole idea of capitalism and, and, and to listen to some Christian people. You know, I remember one of the schools that I graduated from, the president, when there was a uh, large oil spill by Sunoco, the president defended, he was the leader of a Christian school, what used to be the most, the foremost Bible school on planet Earth, maybe. And he defended the Sunoco oil spill that we can't be judgmental. And he was, I wrote him a letter. I wrote him a letter and I rebuked him about defending Sunoco. I just happened to have also had a relationship with a person 
who had uh, founded a company that sold valves to industry. And his valves were kind of expensive. They were these valves that were fail safe, that were carefully manufactured to undergo the pressure of millions and millions of gallons going, going through pipes. And that valve could make sure that nothing would escape the pipes. And his company went to Sunoco and they, they turned it down because in Asia, they could get a lesser valve for less money. And they knew the valves were faulty. They knew the valves were faulty before there was a break in that main, in that uh, in, in the ocean. And, and so um, it's a terrible, terrible spill that affected the world ecologically, uh, marine life fresh water sources. It was a tremendous, tremendous uh, disaster. And this leader of a Bible school, I mean, or maybe a university, used to be a Bible school, defended it. You know why? Because he was a capitalist. He's a capitalist. He's a capitalist. I used to go to school with the guy. He didn't answer my letter, but it was okay. I know he got it. I sent it to his personal email. And um, um, and so they could have averted that problem for, I mean, just a little bit more money. Um, you know, let's say that the valve costs one hundred and fifty dollars per valve, which sounds like a lot of money, but not to Sunoco. And they got a valve that's twenty dollars, and they got what they paid for, uh, because it wasn't pressure tested, and that's just an inside insight that I had gotten. All those years ago when that happened, terrible, terrible thing. Um, what I'm saying is that capitalism has really affected how we see our faith and how we interact with God and how we interact with the world around us. It affects how we show up in the world. It's compromised the church. The church is not as powerful as she could be, mostly, I think, because of capitalism. Materialism, yes but also capital. Let me tell you what I mean by capital. Let me give you a deeper definition. Capitalism is defined this way. Uh, this is the Paul James definition, an economic, and I'm going to say pseudo-religious system, because capitalism is a religion. It is a side religion to Christianity. Christianity and capitalism are barely discernible sometimes. Just turn on Christian networks and just hear what you hear. <laughs> you know, uh, some of the preachers that are on there, what they say, it's an economic and, and pseudo-religious system characterized by private ownership in which only the free market controls the production of good, goods and services. Only the free market, where we can make as much money as we want and can, controls the production of goods and services. Cap capitalism is the idea that everyone makes as much personal profit as possible to keep just for themselves without government intervention or control. So the government, the United States government, only regulates and barely does that. Slightly regulates greed and capitalism and monopolies and monopolies. You know, I use uh, Apple products and they get on my nerves because they're always doing something proprietary. They always, they can't ever do anything that uh, is compatible with all of the other devices that we have in the world. That's why my one pet peeve with Mac. They make a good product, but um, they have their own. And so the government had to step in and say, you have to change your, your fire wires. You have to change your chargers to be a USB charger. They've taken USB uh, uh, ports out of their uh, computers and laptops. It just drives me up a wall. It drives me up a wall. So I can't put a USB in. I can't you know, because they want only their proprietary stuff because it's capitalism. They want to make as much money as they can in the trillions of dollars. And they don't want they want the market to control it. OK, and they don't want the government telling them how much money they can make. OK, uh, I've talked about uh, how there is no ethical path to being a billionaire. And I hate to say it sound like I hate to be that guy, but there is no ethical path to having $140 billion. What are you doing with $140 billion? We got like five people that have uh, the same amount of money of half of the Americans. The last time I checked, it's about, let's say we got 330 million Americans. The bottom half, which may even be more than that, the bottom half, it may be, um, let's say uh, 
we got five people with the same amount of wealth totally than maybe uh, nearly 200 million people. There's just something really wrong with that in America. Something really wrong with that. And it never serves uh, the best interests of everyone. But I'm not going to get on that hobby horse. <laughs> um, but uh, capitalism is that. I, I, it's for me. It's for me. It's not. It's okay if there's pain. It's okay if there's suffering. If it's okay if there's a huge societal problem that I have all of the resources to solve and not change my lifestyle at all. I'm not doing that. I'm keeping it for myself. And with the United Auto Workers out of work right now, they're on strike because their pay is not kept pace with the 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 uh, cost of living. Of course, they have to go on strike, and they they hoard the money. It's like amazing. CEOs making twenty million a year. Twenty million a year. You can't make it by on a million. You need twenty million a year. You don't work as hard as those on the assembly line, do you? And okay, maybe if we even say you're more valuable, are you that much more valuable? You're four hundred times more valuable than the person that make the cars. Wait a minute, how's that possible? If you don't make any cars. And there are people that do, and you make 400 times more than There's something very wrong with that. That's the kind of, not to mention stock options. You know, uh, I mentioned the man that helped run Hahnemann into the ground. He got a $5 million parachute. $5 million for failing to keep Hahnemann University and hospital viable. That's capitalism. And it's just for certain people. Certain people get, ca get uh, parachutes. All of the workers don't get parachutes. You don't get a parachute. I don't get a parachute. If we make, if we work for a major corporation, uh, as much personal profit as possible to keep just for ourselves, and there's no power, governmental or otherwise, that can san uh, sanction us or keep us from making money. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. That there's no competition. You know, I want you to think of this. All of your news, all of it, all your news, it comes from maybe five sources, all of the news. I want you to think about that, all of the news. What happens if there are two or three mergers? If there's two mergers, it might be two sources of news. Or there could be one source of news, which sounds shockingly like revelation and one world system and the beast. So, you know, the Antichrist. So uh, these capitalism doesn't lead anywhere good as an ideology. It is not biblical. The Bible says, in, and it's so interesting to me, that so many Christians that are capitalists, and I'm not trying to say I don't want people to make money and do well. I really do want people to do well, but not at the expense of people. And there should be profit sharing. If we have a very good year, I mean, there's un, there's record earnings in the car and cars, and they're higher. They're more expensive, but people have got tired of being crammed up, cramped up in the uh, pandemic, and so they uh, they want to drive and they want to drive something new, and they got stimulus money, you know. And so um, uh, it's interesting to me that they don't want to share, you know, because they want to look out for their investors. They want to protect the investors so yeah that that is in a nutshell what capitalism is all about look what god says he, about babylon he is as greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied capitalists are never satisfied and that can mean you and i i'm not pointing a finger uh greediness can be as greedy like the grave just like death is never satisfied greedy people who are capitalists are never satisfied. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion, who uh, threatens people, who bullies people. We got a we got a trial going on in New York right now. Let's describe that person in Habakkuk two. You have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. That's capitalism, where you destroy. Where you love it, you know, at some point somebody had to put a highway through neighborhoods in Brooklyn or the Bronx or North Philly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, just just put a highway right through homes, eminent domain, it's called. That's capitalism. Wiping out businesses, 
That's capitalism. Just, you know, uh, destroying lands and cities for the good of capitalism. So cars can go and we can do commerce and trucks can move and we can do what we got to do not on uh, insufficient roads. And I understand the complexity of that. I'm not on a high horse saying that. I'm just being descriptive of what the Bible says. Greedy is the grave, piling up stolen goods. Stolen goods is overvaluing my property. That is worth this much and I make it two times that much. That's stealing. I'm stealing equity. Okay. I'm stealing equity. Uh, you have shed blood and you've destroyed lands, et cetera. You've taken what's not yours. There are sacred lands that people have uh, ancestors in, the Native Americans that have been taken uh, unceremoniously. And so look at what Genesis 9 6 says whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. I think people use that for capital punishment. I'm going to go on record. I don't. I, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure. I believe in capital punishment. Not that I don't think people deserve to lose their lives for killing people. I think people do deserve to lose their lives for killing people. I'm just not sure America's qualified. I mean, it's not just the taking a life. If it was just the taking a life because somebody took a life, it'd be easy, wouldn't it? But We've killed the wrong people. And then when I look at the industrial prison complex and I see a, pro, a, a preponderance of people who are only 12% of the population making up 60% of the inmates, there's something wrong there. So I'm not sure America is, uh, this is not a very evangelical Bible-believing cultural Christian position that I'm putting forth, but I'm not sure we're qualified to, to end people's lives in this nation. I'm not so sure about that. I'm not sure we have a uniform sense of morality and spirituality and God consciousness. And I want a state, if a state is going to take a life, they got to answer to God and be a people of prayer. I mean, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure that uh, America is worthy of taking the life of somebody, especially if they look like you. I'm just not so sure of that. I'm not, I don't have a hard and fast position. But uh, yeah, I got issues. You know, woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. Isn't this interesting? Setting a nest on high sounds like a condo, a luxury condo in the sky, <laughs> a deluxe apartment in the sky, as was sung in the Jeffersons. Um, that's capitalism. That's capitalism. Uh, look at what 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10 says. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. That's what Job said. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Think of that. God says, if you got something to wear and got food, you should be content. That's the standard of provision, God says. But isn't God good that he gives us more than just food and more than clothing? Those who want to get rich, however fall into a temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money, not money itself. Money is not the root of all evil, but the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I like how, I think the King James puts it, pierced themselves with many a pang that uh, their desires pierce them. They stab themselves with desires. That is capitalism, and that's kind of the final word on capitalism. And so the three dysfunctions of powerful nations is materialism, that what I have, what I see, what I can taste, what I can hear and interact with is the ultimate reality. Capitalism, that I get all I can, can all I get, and sit on the can because it's mine. Third and final dysfunction of powerful nations is imperialism. And so we said, I want stuff. I want lots of stuff. Imperialism says, I want your stuff. I want your stuff. It was very clear that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That was not a secret. There were no weapons of mass destruction. The White House knew. The president's cabinet at the time knew there were no weapons of mass destruction. Yet we went to war for 45 minutes and defeated Iraq. It only took 45 minutes. A country that is the size of Tennessee 
Um, imagine all of the United States going against Tennessee. Well, it would only last 45 minutes. It was very quick, very unceremonious. And, um, well, I don't think it's by mistake that that um, that's the third richest oil reserve on planet Earth. The third richest oil reserve at the time was Iraq. It also is not by mistake that Halliburton, based in Houston, and which was the former employ <laughs> employer, I can barely get it out, of Vice President Dick Cheney, handled all of the oil after the 45-minute war with Iraq. That is imperialism. It's not just I want stuff. And it's not just that I want a lot of stuff. God says, in Habakkuk 2, I want your stuff. In fact, I'm coming for your stuff. That's imperialism, you see? Uh, let me give you a more involved. Uh, well, look, look at this image, this image. Go back to the image. Look at the image. I, I think it's clever. This cartoonist takes the stripes of America's flag and wraps it around the world several times. It's kind of clever that America uses its stripes as ropes, as tethers to tether the wealth all around the world. I've had evangelical ministries do investigations on me when I showed up in Africa because I showed up in Africa giving away money and buying things for people on the ground. Uh, and I'm a pretty little guy, you know, as ministries go because they're keeping uh, their partners, their partners in nations, these missions agencies, their partners, they keep them poor. And I come in there liberating and looking like them. And I always, if I go on a missions trip, I leave cash. I leave money. I leave, I leave that place better. And I listen and I learn and I get enriched and blessed. Because ultimately, it's not just about me bringing the gospel or bringing the word of God or bringing training, leadership training. It is about me growing and talking to people from a continent I came from. My bloodlines lead back. I can tell you where they lead back in Africa. And um, and uh, every time I've been there, I, I've ruffled some feathers with some evangelical missions agencies because they're imperialistic. They have their tentacles and their stripes around the natural resources of people and land. You can buy a lot of land in Africa and build on it for a little bit of money, a little bit of money. I'd be a mega church pastor in a very short time if I went to Africa. <laughs> um, it'd be easy to do. Um, uh, I've preached to thousands of people. I think the record, my record is 15,000 people in a place called Bujuburum, a refugee camp of Liberians in Ghana. 15,000 people you'll pass to preach to, just like that. Desperate for the word of God, desperate for hope. It was called a hope and healing crusade. Well, let me tell you what imperialism is. Now I'm ready to go. A policy of extending a country's power and influence over another country through diplomacy. Sounds good enough. Political maneuvering, puppet leaders. We put a person in power. Subterfuge. See, if I wanted to be simple and I wasn't a wordsmith, I would just say deception. But I had to say subterfuge. You know why I said subterfuge? Because of the sub part of it, that it's undercover. There are undercover ways that a nation will do things that are not upfront and not out in the open. Okay? Subterfuge, uh, which is another word for deception or military force if need be. Military force. And then colonialism which is another factor that happens. We see in Africa, we've seen it in Asia for years. Uh, we're seeing it between China, mainland China and Taiwan. It's the practice of domination of a nation, one nation over another nation. And imperialism is the ideology behind that practice. So we wanna extend our power and influence. Maybe it's land, maybe it's precious metals, maybe it's oil, uh, whatever it is, we want it. Maybe it's people like the slave trade. Okay, chattel slavery is a form of imperialism. Uh, you are here. You are here tonight. Uh, let's do it. Let's do a commercial. This Bible class brought to you through slavery. <laughs> that is our sponsor. That's how we got here. We got here by God's grace. Chattel slavery and imperialism. 
snatched humans from one continent to work for free and the different, it's an innovation, never been done in the history of mankind of all the slavery we've seen, perpetual slavery that you're never free from. Not only are you mine, but your children are mine and your children's children and your children's children's children are mine in infinity. And a nation went to war over it. Do you, I want you to think about this. We were willing to be two nations, North and South, over whether people could own you or not, a lot of y'all, or your ancestors. Hey, you don't get rid of that. You don't get rid of that story. And nobody wants to talk about it now. We're whitewashing history. But uh, God don't whitewash history. He tells the truth about these people that are taking other people's stuff. I want your stuff. I'm extending my power and influence over another country through diplomacy. Seems like nice. that's nice people in suits shaking hands and going to ceremonies. And I just want to thank all of you. You know, a lot of these countries have uh, been angry at Great Britain. You know, Great Britain is an empire. And they have, you know, places like the Virgin Islands and Bermuda and Barbados. Some of these places, they're, uh, they're uh, uh, colonies of the British Empire. Still in 2023, still goes on. Influence and power and diplomacy. A lot of the banking goes uh, to uh, uh, Bermuda and the Virgin Islands and the Cayman Islands, offshore accounts. They're very friendly and very loose in capitalism. And you can store your billions here with us, you see. And the federal government can't get to it, can't tax it, can't find it, you see. Shell corporations done all the time. That's imperialism. And it's a form of colonialism is the muscle of it. I'm dominating you. And I'm taking it. And then you can do about it. And we do that with oil. Exxon Mobil does it. Sunoco does it. Uh, on the west coast of Africa, there's oil everywhere. He, you know, so what is it? He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. Sounds like slavery. You have plotted the ruin of many people. So they had to plot, how do we destroy these people? How do we set them against one another? How, how does... How does a Mali strongman, M-A-L-I, how does a Mali strongman show up with automatic weapons? How does he connect with, with, with uh, machine guns and automatic weapons? I mean, he, he, he waging war in dress shoes. Ain't he got no boots? You know, I mean, how does that happen? Where'd they get all them guns from again? That's imperialism. Because while you're fighting one another, we come in and we take the stuff. We're plotting your ruin so that we can have the stuff, the natural there. Because there is no continent with more natural resources than Africa. Every place I've been in Africa, all around, I've lost track of the countries. Every country I've been to, when I go to lunch or I'm eating in a venue or I'm walking down the street, Chinese people are there. Every single place for the past 20 years I've been. I see Chinese businessmen. Um, there, that's imperialism. That's imperialism. They're stretching their power and influence. They say, we'll build highways for you. We're going to build roads. We're going to build buildings. We're going to build a brand new city hall for you. They, they promise all these things. They got so much money. And the roads, they say, fail. Like there's a saying in some of the, you know, Malawi, we were there a couple of years ago. And they were saying, you know, that's Chinese. That's not a good product. That's Chinese. Comes from China. That's what they say. They say that because the things that China gives them don't work well. or They break down very quickly. They feel taken advantage of because their government, maybe in desperation for cash, has done business with Imperial China. We actually called them Imperial China. You have plundered many nations. The peoples who are left will plunder you. God is kind of saying, I'm turning things around, maybe. And lastly, will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey. I want you to know, China, as of to today, owns about $8.7 trillion of debt of America. I want you to think about that. They're waging a kind of an economic war. And they own $8.7 trillion in debt. Japan owns trillions of dollars in debt. And last time I checked, our debt, national debt, is somewhere like $34.5 trillion. 
Um, boy, that sounds like this. He actually says, will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey. James 1.27 says this as a kind of final word of that. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this. And I'm talking to all of us to look after orphans and widows and their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. That's really Christianity. So I cringe when people say, well, you know, America is a Christian nation. I don't think so. We're a nation with Christians in it. We're not a Christian nation. Sometimes even Christians don't run as a Christian nation or as a Christian church, but are more capitalistic, more materialistic. We must be careful. And I'm not uh, being self-righteous about it because I'm a part of all of that to some degree. Um, but I cry out against it tonight as it is in the scriptures that if we want to have pure religion, if we will, pure faith, we got to, what are we doing for the poor? What are we doing? The point here is not orphans and widows. The point here is the poorest of people. There's a reason why in conservative and evangelical circles, that there's a preoccupation with the prenatal baby, which is a good thing. I think it's wonderful that you want to protect life. I think to be pro-life is fantastic, but you just can't be pro-life to the prenatal. And then all of your policies don't help the poor or all of your policies don't regulate record years, three in a row, five in a row for auto uh, uh, companies. And they don't share... Uh, the money with their workers and somebody gets sick there in debt and die in debt, we got to do better than that. And so the point here, what are you doing for the least of these? What are you doing for the most vulnerable people? What are we doing for the homeless? What are we doing for those with mental health issues? What are we doing for returning citizens? What are we doing? And how did they wind up in prison in the first place? There's a lot of questions that, and and, and um, this is where Habakkuk 2 is more current, more current than tomorrow's newspaper. I got to land this plane. There's five proclamations of God in response to international dysfunction, whether it is materialism or capitalism or imperialism and colonialism inside of imperialism that uses force to take control of people. Here's the first proclamation of God. It's this. God says to write down the vision and wait for it. Write down the vision and write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. I have contextualized, which I think is my job, Habakkuk 2 with the times in which we live. And I've talked about America and I've talked about the West, but America in particular. And how we are guilty of some of the things that God cries out against. God's point is, I see everything. But write down the revelation and wait. Everything that I say is going to come true. I've shared some of the things in the way of judgment that God says is going to come true, like your creditors are coming for you. That's something that America has to be concerned about for them to own so much of the debt of the United States. Talking about China and Japan. Secondly, here's the second proclamation. God says that the righteous live by faith in difficult times. You and I live by faith in difficult times. Don't lose heart. Um, see, the enemy is puffed up. His uh, 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 he, He's wicked, but the righteous person will live by his or her faithfulness. God says we will live by faith. What does that mean? It means not only our lifestyle, but it means that that which sustains us is our faith. That's what gets us to the next day is our faith. It's not money. It's not the things we have. It's not making as much as we can. It is not putting our faith in things. And I like nice things. There's nothing wrong with driving a nice car, living in a nice house. I'll be the first to rejoice. I really believe God wants to bless you. I'm not anti-blessing. I am anti-capitalism. And I am anti-materialism. Even though I got some material things like you. And I am anti-imperialism, uh, uh, but I'm not anti-blessing. God is a good God. And we don't have to believe that stuff is the ultimate reality. And we don't have to believe that we got to make as much money as possible, and that's our main mission in life. We don't have to believe that we got to get some money from other places. I remember a preacher, one of my colleagues, good friend of mine, uh, was trying to get me to buy Iraq coinage, Iraq money, currency, because it was going to go up. 
the value. I thought the dude was crazy. You know, uh, this guy's always got some harebrained schemes. Good man. I like him. He's a friend of mine. And uh, but my preacher friend. Why? Because he's kind of a capitalist. He's saying, you know, go, go in with me as I buy some. Right. That doesn't make no sense to me. You mean we're going to buy the money of the losers? Uh, it didn't make any sense to me. So needless to say, I did not invest in Iraqi coinage and currency. It didn't make any sense to me. And you should never buy what you don't understand. Uh, we're going to live by faith in difficult times. Look at the third proclamation in response to international dysfunction. God says that the earth will be filled with his knowledge and glory. The knowledge of who he is and, the, and also his glory. The earth will soon be filled with the knowledge of he and his glory. In verse 14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You see water over seas and oceans. So my glory will cover the earth. One day, the, f the fulfillment of that incompletion, Habakkuk never saw. But he did see the overthrow of Babylon. And he did see the emergence of Persia. He saw that in all likelihood. Look at the fourth proclamation. I only got five. God says that he will one day turn the tables on the wicked. Don't worry about the wicked. Don't worry about the wicked. Don't worry about uh, people looking like they're getting away with things. You will be filled with shame, he says, of such people, instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Wow. Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. God is going to expose some people as naked for everything they've done. There are people that have been uplifted, who have been lionized, who have been worshipped, cult of personality. God says, I'm going to let you drink and let your nakedness be exposed. You're going to be drunk on your own power and be exposed, kind of an allusion to Noah when he was drunk. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you, and disgrace will cover your glory. And so God is saying, there's a cup that I have with your defeat in it, and I'm going to hand you the cup, and you won't be able to refuse it. And this disgrace that is future is going to cover your glory and where you thought you were hot, okay? And finally, God says, that he is in his temple, and that we should be silent. Ultimately, God says, I am in his temple. The th interesting thing about the temple, I don't think he means the holy of holies. I don't think that he means an ethereal place in the throne room of heaven. I don't think so. I think he's saying that he sets up his Shekinah in the earth, his local presence, and that when he is in the earth, all the earth should keep silent because he's in control. This is his response. God, Yahweh, to the complaint of the prophet Habakkuk. Write down the vision and wait for it. The righteous are going to live by their faith in difficult times. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of who I am and my glory. And one day I'm going to turn the tables on the wicked that you complain about and that you feel taken advantage of. And right now, I'm in my holy temple, not afar off in heaven, but in the earth overseeing the affairs of men and you should be silent in my presence here's some homework for you for next week this is the final homework what does the hebrew term shigianoth mean shigianoth i'm gonna see who's gonna look that up for me what is its significance to habakkuk shigianoth it can mean different things i'm anxious to hear what you have to say about it uh because that is what chapter three is labeled a shigianoth how did Habakkuk's perspective change from chapter one to chapter three? It is a shift. In what sense, or excuse me, I'm sorry, in what tense does Habakkuk write his ode to Yahweh? Uh, chapter three is a kind of psalm of praise to Yahweh. What's the tense of it? Past, present, future. Which tense did he write it in? And then lastly, I told you I'd give you three. I thought I'd give you a bonus question. What is Habakkuk's final determination at the end of the book? What is his final determination at the end of his book? Look, I got 17 closing questions that I'm going to rattle off very quickly. 
for all of you that have questions for God. This is how I'm going to close. 17 closing questions. Won't take long at all. And this is the reading. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him. That's for you. And his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Question number one, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counsel? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him and who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. With whom then will you compare your God? To what image will you liken him? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned upon the circle, above the circle of the earth. And its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all of these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength, and not one of them is missing. Why do you complain? Why do you say, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young. The Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The Lord always adds a blessing to the reading of his word, for the good of our souls. I want you to realize that God is on your side and that he is perfecting everything concerning you. We can fold this uh, presentation and say goodbye. It's so good to see all of you. I enjoyed you and uh, enjoyed you showing up. Thank you so much for showing up and listening well and 